Welcome to Office Hours. If you're watching on YouTube and you want to learn more about what we do here, you can visit officehours.global. Our first hour is general questions around media and virtual production. Our second hour is something that we want to spend a little bit more time on. And today we have some folks from our Office Hours crew that is going to talk about the Cyber Rodeo event. And if tomorrow, yes, tomorrow we've got Carl Asmussen talking to us about synthesizers. So if you want to learn more about the schedule that we have this week, visit officehours.global. And producers, a reminder, this is a great opportunity for you to post questions that you want us to answer during our first hour. All right, let's go, Bill. Thank you, Liberty. Our first question this morning comes from Aaron Giancarla uh, in Flagstaff, Arizona. He says, the ATEM ISO Extreme shuts off key one when the cut button is pressed on the board. This does not happen when using the software. Any ideas why? Mm, Jason. Um, if I were to guess, I would say that um, the ATEM Mini Extreme, uh, there's a setting in, um, what's it called? Oh, I am frozen. I will cut to Jonas to tell. Okay, Jonas. Yes, so what he uh, just mentioned, there's uh, two apps that you get with the ATEM, the ATEM software control that everyone knows. There's also the little setup tool called ATEM Setup. If you go into Setup, um, it took me a while, you scroll down and suddenly you can change not only the switching mode, but also what happens on the cut. Annoyingly, the cut in on the panel itself is not a real cut. It is a programmatic cut where they have some special conditions depending on what you set there. So also stuff like um, keying stuff for the next transition doesn't really affect it. Um, it takes a little to fiddle with it. Um, I drop everything with transition because then I felt it's the most consistent. All right. Do we have Jason back yet? Or we yeah, should... I'm good. Okay. That was a perfect answer. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next question. Next one comes from David Brady, uh, New York City. V uh, Vicrio listener, is anyone using it to open files on remote uh, in remote computers via Stream Deck? For the life of me, I cannot get it to work. Logs show that the command arrives, but there are no results from it. Jeffrey? Yeah, I've, I've used this uh, for many years. Uh, uh, it's either Visrio or Vicrio. I call it Vicrio or listener. Uh, so basically in Stream Deck, what you do is you, you set it up one, uh, the hotkey to then uh, push into the button to uh, to send out to the listener. If it's receiving it from there, I know when the Windows side, there was a, there was an update that happened that within that update, uh, they uh, you had to redo your firewall uh, because some, some new commands came in for the firewall. And so that might be the one issue. The other one, it, it, although it's getting through, you might still want to try switching the ports. It's uh, usually used listening on 10,001, uh, switch it over to 10,002 and see if that makes a difference. And then finally, uh, whatever program you're going to, you might want to look at their programs on the firewall. Once again, this is on the Windows side and see if, uh, if you need to reset those. Jonas? I'm with you, um, David. I never got it to work. The trick that I use is you can also install Companion on that remote machine and then execute a little shell script that either opens the file or executes a shell script that opens the file. Um, that's the workaround that I found. Okay, next question. Aaron Jen Corelli is right back with, is anyone using any of the Behringer X Air Series in productions? If so, can you give me some details? Thanks. Alex? Yeah, we've used it on the XR18. There's a big jump in, in uh, tool sets and, and what's available between the XR12 and the XR18. So we uh, we have the XR18 um, that, that we've used in the past. Mostly we use it to manage comms. Um, so when we're when we're trying to tie things together, um, we use it kind of as, as audio glue, and it's worked really well. Um, the, the thing that probably bothers me the most is the way it manages delay, because you add it as an FX bus as opposed to a just just adding delay to a channel which um I, I it has the same effect but it uh it just seems wrong go ahead jesse uh yeah i think there's a 12 and a 16 and an 18 and um probably best to lean towards the 16 or 18 and uh, there is a, a built-in uh, access point uh, on the devices which is really not that great whenever it's sitting on the ground and uh, using, you know, patching your cables in that way. So you want to bring your own Wi-Fi router. And then also um, you can use something like this, which is a mixing station app. And that works with all the uh, XR series and, and Behringer uh, 
series mixers, and then you can sort of customize your uh, UI for your your uh, control panel there. But they're really handy. They're pretty cheap, um, and they have the Midas uh, preamps, a little bit uh, better quality preamps as well. Midas designed preamps. Next question. Andy Kokendorfer in VR Florida says we are trying to convince execs to dismantle open offices in favor of small private offices and collaboration spaces. Thoughts on the best way to convince executives? Thanks. Bill. Well, so this is a trend that I, I don't know a single worker in a single office who loves these open offices. I do understand that they are substantially less expensive for corporations. And I've worked with some big companies that moved a lot of people and moved buildings. And let's face it, getting actual construction crews in to set up walls and to tape and paint and the rest of that is way more expensive than bolting together an open office plan thing. I would just think that they would, that in many businesses where where your, the communication now happens not just by telephone, but more and more online. The fact that you're going to be in an open plan is going to be is going to expose the potential for conversations around you to get into whatever feed you're doing. I might push a little bit on the security aspect of if we don't have more people in controllable spaces, you may be at risk of of breaching corporate security and particularly in those call center things where conversations are happening all the time, that would be a bad thing. It's the only thing I can think of because the money is pushing it now, I think. Yeah, it'd be interesting to just find out what kind of workspace it is uh, or company culture wise. Mitchell? Yeah, I agree with Bill. I think that security is a uh, good uh, point to use. Uh, the other one is just be more productive. I think if, if they find that you're more productive because you have a closed in office space, um, they're going to move in that direction. The other problem is that there are less employees returning to work for lots of different reasons. So maybe there's a lot more open space and it just makes more sense to uh, to you know, put it all together uh, in an office uh, as opposed to a wide open plan. But I, I just think we need to preface the point that it, it, there is no study that shows that an open office plan increases productivity. It just doesn't work. Rupert? So the uh, cultural point, I think what many uh, maybe leaders and companies and are trying to do is trying to invent the spaces that they believe are going to be attractive to people to come into work to attract them back into the office. Whether they're getting that right or wrong, I, I don't know. But, you know, that's, I think, what's leading uh, a lot of those decision makers to think that way is just tr simply trying to create an environment that they think will be successful based on what they maybe are sensing there talent that they're looking for is is seeking in an office having said that if that those you know those offices those those spaces those workers are going to be involved in any kind of hybrid meetings online anything you know like it's already been mentioned i think the best thing the leadership could do in those cases is witness you know some of those meetings some of those hybrid things and just judge the the success and the comfort of those events as as they see them and go from there alex yeah, I mean, probably what we wouldn't say, which is the truth, is that, that open offices are probably the worst idea in corporate America uh, in the last 50 years. <laughs> like it was just there. I've worked in many of them and um, they're just dumb. You know, they're, 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 they save money, but they're dumb ideas, you know, and they drive people crazy. You watch, I mean, half the people put the headphones on all the time. So if you go through an open office, what you see is an incredible investment in really good headphones so that people can actually work. So everything that they thought that they were going to fix was, was actually made worse by the fact that people shut everybody out. And then they have to stand up and go somewhere every time they have a phone call because there's just people around them. They can't, you know, you can't hear sideways. It's, it is, it is the most, uh, you know, productivity damaging thing that you can do in a corporate office. Um, so the, the main thing though, is that as you look at, at hybrid, um, as, as, as Rupert was uh, alluding to, um, the hybrid situation means that you really want people to, you don't really want them all in, con you don't want half of them in conference room that usually has bad audio. You want them to be really in an individual space and, and giving them their own individual spaces that are um, quiet, uh, well lit, um, you know, with, with good equipment is going to actually improve their ability to be on, you know, on the hybrid things because some of their, some of the folks are not coming back to the office and people need to kind of get their head around it. People had a long time to see what, what life was like outside of the office. And there's a, some of your most productive, productive employees are not going to want to stay there when, whether they quit immediately or they just prep their LinkedIn, your, you know, offices are basically standing on sand, you know, like, you know, like people are, you know, when people don't have to go into an office, they can live anywhere. And, and that's, that is a, 
um, very, very disruptive situation, you know, and, and offices are going to have to figure out how to make employees happy to be there because other offices, I mean, there's lots of companies that are aggressively moving towards a remote and hybrid um, environment to, to attract talent from the companies that aren't willing to do that. Jeffrey? So first of all, and the biggest, most important thing is I have no idea what this business is. Uh, so I don't know if it's got an open office is going to work for you or not. Second of all, as an IT person who's done this, uh, I've, I've worked in call centers. I've worked in, uh, I've worked in, in offices on a regular basis, uh, moving, moving it into more uh, remote, uh, offices makes it really tough on the IT, especially with data security. So, uh, being it, being able to go to one building to fix one person's problem then you have to drive to another building and yeah you can get more it people to do that and that's that that'll uh, uh kind of counter on that situation but you're still running into a lot of how do you connect one building to another uh and of course the costs that are on there um open offices the best part about an open office is you could actually tear down all the cubicles and set up a new configuration within uh, within a day or two and then go from there. There are some situations where you do need to have your office mates in a very close situation so you can go to them for questions, for, for information like that. I would look more not as in uh, talking about it private, private offices, but more about taking that open office and closing it up a little bit more, putting uh, putting walls up so you can have the same small collaboration areas, but still have everybody still in the same building. That makes everybody happy and that makes uh, the IT uh, flow work a little bit better. And, uh, and of course, everything, everybody, will, yeah, everybody will be happy on that. Yeah, and just a, a minor update. Andy also said that um, their leases are up soon, so they're also trying to make this make this case so that as I take it as their their leadership team finds new space so that they can get closed um, spaces. And Jesse, to round off the question. Yeah, sure. Um, one of the best ways to make a case is to demonstrate uh, the difference and demonstrate what you can do. So uh, maybe find, pull one of those execs aside and say, let's do before we move from this empty and echoey space, let's do a demo video or hop on the all staff meeting as is, and then let's take you to a, a more isolated space with a better setup and then, you know, get everyone to look at both. And then, um, you know, the team will make the decision there. Yeah. And what's most important is to find out, you know, what's the hesitation from the leadership. So to Jesse's point in having that conversation, see, uh, try to get an understanding of where they're coming from and then being able to build your case around that. You can always show better than you can tell. So if you can show more productivity and being a close space, then um, that'd be the way to go. Next question. Next one comes to us from Adrian Albeck in Brisbane, Australia, and he says, I'm looking to buy a new monitor. I see the spec has 100% sRGB color accuracy. Is this important or not? Just, uh, sorry, Jason. The answer, as with many things in office hours, is it depends. I would say that sRGB 100% is going to be most monitors. I would say the other things that matter would be um, you, you want IPS or in-plane switching if you're going to go with an LCD. Uh, that uh, is the ease, well, let's see. Basically, re red tend to shift from side to side when um, when you have a TN panel, and that's that's not ideal. I would say P3 is a good place to start if you're buying a new monitor today. And Bill? I would just note that it, it that sRGB 100% is not the same as an actual grading monitor. So if you're thinking that you're going to do critical color, that fact alone isn't the same as making sure that it's standard spec for somebody who's doing color uh, in critical mission critical circumstances. Next question. Uh, Douglas Carmichael, in the transmission rack 090 used, and he's got a link there to it, the Cat5 cables go through a hollowed out panel. Why so, and where could you get them? Jonas? Because the cable have to go to the front if you want to mount the switch in the front, and there are certain applications where maybe you want to suddenly plug down uh, an encoder. It's just a panel that has an O insert, so it's probably either like a rack panel that um, was empty and then you put a hole into that or there's a certain distributors that do that. 
um, you often also see like some type of brush in there to brush the cables and then them reaching out. Next question. Guy Cochran in Seattle says, how would you play a uh, how would you play pre-recorded segments into a Zoom meeting? David? Uh, my app of choice is Ecamm Live. You could also use vMix or um, any of the others OBS to bring video right in. And of course, you could also uh, screen share and share video that way. Alex. And the one that I've used the most uh, for this is Memo Live, just because it's got a lot of features and I'm able to stack things up with the, the lists and add graphics and so on and so forth. So when I'm doing kind of a standalone um, type of event without a lot of hardware, then I tend to use uh, Memo Live. Mitchell? Looking forward to using Hyperdeck Shuttle. It should be interesting. <laughs> and Bill? And Mitchell got there right before I was saying the Hyperdeck Shuttle that they just announced at Blackmagic really looks like a fabulous product for that. Go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, so many ways to do this. Um, but, you know, just to say, I typically don't use the screen share option because um, it kind of discombobulates, it can discombobulate the view on the participant end. So sending the video in as another Zoom square and just utilizing that seems to be the best way via hardware or software. Yeah, we do that too. It just has a more seamless look than than just the the screen share. Josh? You actually don't need any extra hardware or software to send pre-recorded video that you have on your computer into Zoom. You can use the advanced uh, screen, uh, the advanced video feature is what it's called in the advanced menu. And the nice part about that is it will optimize the uh, Zoom will actually be the server for you. Uh, you won't have to worry about any of those annoying glitches of sharing things on the screen uh, or the audio uh, problems or worrying about putting the wrong audio source in. It'll play that source as long as you have it on your computer and you know where you can navigate to. And then can you do playlists or is it like one at a time? It's been a minute since I've done that, but I remember that feature. You will have to enable each one individually, but there's also um, queuing functions that you can do while you have it up. So you could pause it and scrub through the timeline. Plus you can peek at it and see how long uh, you have left in the track, which is something you might not want to do if you're sharing it directly from your screen. Awesome. Just figured that would be helpful. Rupert. If you are using any of the methods that involves sharing a, the video in through your camera pipeline, then you'll need to be in an HD meeting to make sure that you're getting a, you know, an HD signal through to share your video. Otherwise, your best bet is probably one of the sharing options, either sharing the video or sharing the screen. And Alex? And my first answer was software only, but if you're using hardware, one great uh, cost effective way is PlayoutB through an ATEM Mini. So, and one of the things you want to think about with that is that if you, you need to be taking the audio from your switcher to get it in there, so because that's where the audio is going to pass into it. I mean, typically, there's I think there's probably some ways to sort that out, but but the um, but PlayoutB is great because it acts as a hyperdeck, um, and Jonas is too. Uh, too modest to uh, bring it up that it's a, it's his product. So we have someone actually in the group that that builds it. So it, that that that's convenient when when you uh, want to talk about how it works. Um, the uh, uh, it's it it's very very useful and it just runs on a Raspberry Pi. I mean, you can run it on other things too, PC, Mac. Um, but but it runs on a Raspberry Pi. You can have it sitting there, and that's actually I'm building one for someone right now, and I'm, that's what I'm putting in, into the system to have them play out their videos. Next question. Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington is back with this one. What would be the best way to send a remote camera feed from the Cinegare or NAM conventions into Office Hours 2.0? Timely question, Alex. I think one of the things is whether we need to be real time or not. So are we going to have a two way conversation or not? Um, if we're going to have a uh, um, not have a two way conversation and we're simply sending it out, something like a live view would probably make sense. Um, because and then we take a live view to a receiver and then that receiver is just plumbing into the system what we would what i would like to do um, for these is to is to for the feeds themselves we want to feed it back into for the panelists to see but for the youtube feed we want that video to go straight into the youtube feed as opposed to into zoom because um, the quality will be much higher noah yeah, and thankfully we have a little bit of time to kind of think through this and talk about this on the show at different points. But um, my thought or mention was, you know, Cine Gears is about 45 minutes for me and NAM is 10 minutes for me. So the good thing is um, I could support those with hardware, right? Um, more so than uh, Vegas, which is a little further and we have a little bit of runway this time, thankfully. Um, so yeah, let's keep talking about this and figuring this out. But as far as the transport goes, yeah, we need some sort of um, probably bonded cell cellular 
to send that out. Um, and whether it's Zoom or um, an RTMP or RTS or whatever, we, we need to figure out those protocols as well. Jeffrey? Well, I've I've done live stream from uh, Nam before, and uh, of course, I don't have I didn't have the uh, bonded cellular or anything like that. A lot of things, a lot of times, what I did was, especially once again, you're dealing with a lot of noise inside of Nam. So what I did was I I actually recorded the interview on my camera, and then I did about five or six of them, and then I went out to a hallway or an open space where uh, where you could get a better antenna signal, and then and less uh, less. Uh, uh, saturation of people and then uh, actually just played the videos through and then uh, a live stream that there so as close to uh, live as possible and that worked really well uh, as for Cinegear the only concern that I have is that because it's uh, Cinegear is on the Paramount lot I believe it's on the Paramount lot this year it has been in, in years past and uh, which is open a lot of the times you, you'll you'll go into hangars and things like that for for some of it but a lot of it is on the open you'll actually be walking the streets of New York type thing to do that however it is also a private lot so I don't know if there's any concern with uh, being able to live stream from these lots because I've never done that that way. Once again, I always took it back to a, a station and then pushed it out that way. Alex? Yeah, the um, uh, Center Gear this year is an LA convention center, so it's a slightly different uh, setup than, than it has been in the past years. Um, and I think that the thing we hopefully will do is probably, like NAB, find a couple different ways of transport and get them out in different ways to see which one works in each location. Jonas? Cable. We'll just get all the vendors to allow us a little box that we can yeah. plug in. And then as soon as we arrive, the best way would be a cable. And Noah. I heard from a friend of mine who's an executive at Roland that they and Fender and a few others are not planning on attending for NAM. So we'll see what the turnout is. But if we could schedule interviews, we should ahead of time. That would be extremely helpful. <laughs> Next question. Douglas Carmichael's up next. Would there be any way to feed content into Keynote via Apple Script and thus into OSC? Alex? Yes. I don't know how it works, but I have seen people do it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so the answer, I get to answer your question, yes, you can do it. Um, there is, uh, I know that Sal Segoin, I think, has some stuff on his automator. Um, I think it's automator.us, but there are some, he's got some examples of putting stuff into Keynote, and I just haven't had time to dig them up there. But take a look, do a search for Sal Segoin. And uh, he is the, the master of the Apple script and the automation in on the Mac. And I believe he's got some stuff on how to put content, like build keynote decks from, uh, from a script. Next question. John Puitt of Huntersville, North Carolina here on the panel says, fonts are fascinating to me. What are some books to learn about the history of fonts and typefaces? Mitchell? It's great to go looking at a font uh, that you want to use and you look, you think it looks modern. You find out it was done by somebody back in the thirties. Um, <laughs> a lot of the, uh, a lot of the, uh, the fonts on fonts.com have a little historical, uh, aspect where they explain who it was that, uh, designed it. But it's, it's always interesting to learn that, uh, where some of these things came from. There are very few modern, modern fonts that have been, uh, designed modern. A lot of them are redos of, uh, of older fonts. Bill? A lot of what Mitch said, I, I just, I saw this and I thought, huh, I wonder how I learned. And I looked back and I couldn't remember all the resources. So I did a Google search on top 10 books on typography. And it came up with a nice little list of things. Some of them I hadn't seen before, uh, split between the technical and like the art of fonts. And I think that might be a good place to look through and see what, what floats your boat about that. And Alex. Yeah, the ones that I have in my library, at least on, on, on some of these, is um, a visual history of type, um, visual survey of 320 typefaces, uh, designing fonts, and uh, just my type. Uh, those are the three that I could find quickly in my, in my uh, collection. So, um, so anyway, yeah, those, that, that, that's where I'd probably start. Next question. John Foltz in Sealings Grove, Pennsylvania, uh, says the uh, Sealings Grove, the Hyperdeck Extreme Controller can control eight Hyperdecks. Does it require RS-422 to the Hyperdecks, or can it use an Ethernet connection? Jason. According to the manual on page 65, it says that the Ethernet jack is not actually active as of right now. So I think right now RS-422 uh, is your best bet. 
All right, next question. David Brady in New York City is up next. He says, ATEP Mini Pro ISO, Mac connected to input one, keynote running full screen. Out of nowhere, the horizontal positioning will glitch and shift as if a four by three signal is present, only to correct after a receipt of the HDMI cable. Any ideas? Jason? Oh, I have a few ideas. Um, first things first, your camera should be on one because the ATEMs can get weird if if not. Second, you should be standardizing your output so that the the um, ATEM doesn't have to guess. So go into the Mac and explicitly tell it, I need this frame rate and this resolution. And I guess the third and final thing is switch out your HDMI cable. It's almost always that. Almost always. <laughs> Noah? Yeah, I would just start at one end of the chain and work towards the other and basically uh, switch out the variable at each step just to check what's happening. But software tends to be my go to first. And then like the HDMI is obviously a, not the, the best connection in the world for sure. And Jeffrey. Yeah, I'm starting to hate the ATEM uh, for their HDMI ports because they have them um, horizontal and across. There are other items, they actually have the HDMI verticals. So when you when you seat those things, they'll have a little bit of uh, play to uh, to put a little bit of pressure onto the HDMI. By having them horizontal, you're, you're finding that you're putting more pressure on them. You're eventually going to pull the pins on the HDMI, on the ATEM, and then it's just you're just going to have problem after problem. So I'm looking into finding a way, and possibly I'm going to probably design something on my 3D printer uh, where the HDMI cables will actually be lifted up uh, through the case or locked down for that matter. That would be the better solution uh, so they don't have anywhere to go. Uh, and you'll probably find that that'll work a lot better. And Alex. Yeah, I, I found that uh, hooking, as, as said before, hooking Macintoshes or Macs into input one is problematic because they tend to want to negotiate, renegotiate. So the Mac says, what do you want? And the ATEM's like, what do you want? The Mac's like, no, no, what do you want? And, and so they, and, and they will occasionally do exactly what you're talking about. So um, it's the last input I will put my, my Macs into is, is input one. Next question. Seven Scroll in Brooklyn says, in a hybrid setting where online questions are coming in already using a v, uh, an X32 for auto mix and mix effect, would a Zoom meeting with breakout rooms be the best to display question askers online? And it may be Zoom ISO. Let's start with Jesse. Um, well, there, there's two th places that you would be displaying those question askers who are online. One is, you know, for a hybrid specifically, one is in the room. Uh, where the live event is going on a physical space and there, um, you know, you can use a zoom room, something like that. And then oh, I'm a Behringer X32 rack right now. So, um, yeah, so, uh, basically you can, uh, display those folks in the room on a projector using like a zoom room where you can say, I want this display to be active speaker or the person that I've spot lit at that time or the gallery or whatever. And then back in the Zoom meeting, um, I don't know if you really necessarily need to do a breakout room. You could basically just spotlight the folks that you want to to have there in Zoom. Um, if you want to do something complicated where you're having separate meetings and separate um, breakout spaces and then having a, a program feed sent to both places, um, you, you know, you have to be crafty as far as how you route that video and audio so that they're in sync. Um, and basically, oh, just a, as another uh, future note, um, Zoom is coming out with this feature called Backstage and potentially do something like that where you have a separate space um, that you're choosing folks to sort of go on to uh, the panel um, into the live, uh, the live uh, main session. So I think there's, there's simple ways to do it within Zoom without having a, uh, the breakout complication. And Alex, we use breakouts for everything. <laughs> so, so, so we was so the way we would do this is you have your general audience that's all in a main room, and, and then we would probably actually break out two or three or four different breakout rooms, dragging each questioner into their own breakout room. Inside of those breakout rooms, we would then have Zoom rooms, you know, as the other participant in those. That what that allows for is two way communication and complete control of the audio. The problem with using them in the general group where everyone's at is you could potentially have other people creating noise that's going to go into the room. So you have total control over each one of those. And so we'd have the next, you know, we, we've done this in the past where you have three or four people 
that are, this is ne the next question and we just keep on round robin, round, round robining that in there. That way we're simply able to cut to that next person. And the reason we only, we have more than two is because we just want more time. So by adding more places that you stack people up. So this is just like the same line in front of the mic. Now, what I will say is that I don't like people asking questions in person, but, but you, can, you can do that. I, I, uh, this is what, how we handle it. When we handle it, I avoid it at almost all costs. Um, I, the text is, uh, better almost 100% of the time. Like there's there's always one out of 10 that is like this amazing interaction with a speaker and then the other nine are slow and boring. Next question. Jacob Goodnight in Indianapolis, Indiana targets the question at Jonas Dattel and says, can uh, you share any upcoming play out B updates? I noticed the Pi version is still at version 9.3, whereas the Mac and Windows are at version 9.4. Jonas. Hopefully there will be an update uh, for 9.0.95. It brings them both together again right now. It's a, there's a lot of problems with the Pi in the latest OS that uh, still need to get solved. Next question. Eric Price in Kansas City, Missouri says, I really love my small rig top and side handles with remote triggers for shooting video with my Lumix, but they only trigger video. Does anyone make something similar for photos and the half press focus capability that cameras often have? Jason? I'm not sure about the half press focus, and it depends, I think, on your Lumix. But um, yeah, the Panasonic DMWRS2 is just a straight up remote release shutter, and that'll take the two and a half millimeter jack that you're probably using on the small rig and, and allow you to just do that remote shutter release. Bill? I'm not familiar with the Panasonics. I know that Canon has implemented that half press in some of their remote controls for their still cameras. So the protocol exists in some systems. I think you just have to dig down and figure out whether yours is enabled for that or not. Next question. Rupert McRae in Dallas, Texas says, any experiences with the self-hosted social networking platform Mastodon? Alex. I think Leo has a Mastodon account. Um, I, I, I was surprised that they're still around. <laughs> so they were a big deal when they came out and then, you know, like, oh, this is going to be the next thing. But I think that uh, if, if you have a lot of, um, it, it works if, if you can supply all the users. The, the, the big ad advantage of a lot of social networks is the network, the network effect. And Mastodon, you kind of give that up. David? They actually spoke about this a little bit yesterday on Twit. Um, I just signed up for one. I followed one person. I have no idea what to do next. <laughs> that's that's everybody's experience we'll have to do a little discovery maybe next question noah Sargent, fullerton california oh this is a toughie how would you mic a college lecture classroom with 150 students where anyone could ask a question mitchell i would pass out a handheld microphone like a uh, sm58 uh and just have them interspersed in the crowd and have them politely pass it back and forth because you're not going to get uh, microphone coverage uh, in a fixed point to cover 150 people. Or even having someone hold the mic <laughs> and passing that around. John Wallace? Yeah, I would do like a DPA for the for whoever is speaking. Um, a handheld mic for any question answers. There's also a box uh, that has a wireless mic in it that you can kind of toss around the room and talking to not the best fidelity, but definitely fun for for students to use. We've done it for a bunch of our trainings and it's definitely gone over well. Alex. And in, in, while we're still at least paying some attention to COVID, uh, passing things around is usually something we'd like to try to avoid um, as having everybody touch it is not something we, we would like to do. Um, one thing to look at is SoundShark. So you could theoretically, I, I haven't done this, but uh, throw one of a, a larger version of this. This is a parabolic, um, uh, receiver. And so basically you put this one, you put a lab into it, but you can also put mics into it. And basically you can point it at that person. And uh, it's used in, by the NFL to grab, you know, coaches talking about things and everybody else. And so Sound, uh, SoundShark is the is the company. They, they, there's an, a second hour actually with the, uh, with the, uh, um, the person who runs that, <laughs> that runs SoundShark. So, so um, uh, that's, that's something to also check out. You could possibly have some one or two people in the front just pointing at the folks that they need to pick up and it might actually work um uh, the, if i had 150 students i would again I, I know that i sound backwards but i would think about text you know finding a way for them to ask questions in some kind of dory system it's really i know people think that they want people to ask questions i've done you know over 2,000 events it, it's horrible 
<laughs> like it's, you know, if you want protein, like if you actually want to get through the data, people talking is a horrible idea. You know, like, it, like it's just, you know, like they're, they're very slow. They spend a lot of time saying what they want to say and very little time. And then they ask a question that no one cares about. Having a, the reason Mukana exists, I mean, when we, the very first, this is the fourth version of this. The first version was in 2008 and we did it at a World Bank meeting and uh, they don't use mics anymore. Jesse? Uh, yeah, in a classroom setting, you know, the teacher wants to go back and forth with the student quite rapidly. So having a quick option for folks would be ideal, like probably at least three or four uh, mics that are directional and dispersed within the class and auto mix uh, turned on. I think that might do it. Yep. Jeffrey? Well, it, this really depends on the room size. So if 150 people, but if the if the theater is set up for like five to a thousand people, you want to get them as close together as possible. So at least you can do that. Uh, if you don't want, if you have a, pro, if there's problems with things like COVID uh, and you don't want to have people touching the mics, the best thing to do is have p two people. Usually it's, a, you have the center aisle and then of course uh, our center spot and then two aisles. So you have one person on each aisle with a boom mic and then they can actually take the boom mic and go up to the row and then they're that way it's hovering over the person rather than they're holding the microphone and asking the question uh then if they're standing and sitting then you can adjust for that that might help on there but once again it really depends on i i don't know the layout of, of the room and bill they're young they're healthy they're students put a couple of mic stands in the room and want to ask a question get on your feet walk to the microphone and ask the question if you want good quality of those questions that's really the only way i think you're going to get high quality audio and they could use some of the the movement <laughs> working working around next question has Mukajar, our friend from cape town south africa says met a medical organization who are tinkering with hybrid events my retort was digital first or in person only should be their plan i have been asked to address them next week what are the key points to mention to argue for digital first alex it's it's more expensive and you you pay more to get less quality when you do a hybrid event period like you you now have to manage how is the audio going to go in and out how are you going to include both both the online and the in room and what generally happens is people because of money they fall to the in room and they spend more time on the in room than the online that means that means that the online is going to get a lower quality experience they may not complain they may even say it was a great event but they will slowly stop coming you are literally poisoning your environment when you do a hybrid event because what happens is, is it's just they just feel little on the outside and it's it's not it's not something it's it's a very very subtle thing that we've seen is that they just you know when something else is when life is busy you need, you need to know whether you're a priority or not and you can build that if they're in person and you can build that if it's a digital first and if it's a hybrid the folks online will feel a little less and they will and it slowly you know poisons the well so it's it's a really Hybrid is pro probably the worst thing to do. Uh, you, you're better off not doing the event. Jesse? Uh, well, I do a lot of hybrid events nowadays, and folks are, are coming back in person, and some folks want to stay at home. So that's kind of the reality of the situation. And and uh, many, you know, uh, people see the events differently. And some folks say, you know, I'm Zoomed out, and I, I want to get off of Zoom, and, and I'm done. And... Uh, some folks say, you know, this has provided greater accessibility for me, so I, I want to be at home and I want to be closer to my family in my work life. Um, so, um, you know, how to argue for that? I mean, I guess each organization will need to try try out the different styles and really work on, I think the, what a, a lot of what Alex is saying is, based, is around uh, preparing the presenters to, um, you know, be ready for what it means to talk to two different groups at the same time and some folks don't have the chops to to do that and it will never be successful with their with their type of content or the the person that's doing it and some folks have the chops to do uh you know both and it'll take a while and take some experimentation for for each organization bill I'm going to stand firmly behind Alex this one. You would never do a patient intake interview while on the phone with somebody else. You just wouldn't do it. You're going to be there or you're going to be there. You can't be both at the same time. Even Michael Jordan, as fabulous an athlete as he was, was different playing baseball than he was at his primary thing. Focus on the most important audience and then 
try to convince them that adding anything else splits your concentration. You're going to do both things a quarter as well, rather than doing one thing beautifully. Rupert? If I'm uh, reading the question correctly, it was a choice between in-person only or digital first. Now, in that case, if you're going to do an in-person only event, it just depends on the dynamics. But I really see those events these days as pretty discriminatory. You're only allowing the people who can actually get there or have the means or it's or who it suits their schedule, whatever. A digital first event has far more reach and is far more inclusive. And then that's before you even get to the environmental uh, considerations. Alex? And and I just want to underline it. We, we've definitely seen the, the same folks, this, the same idea that Jesse was talking about where there's people who want to come in and that's great. And there's people who want to, who don't want to come in and they want to do it over Zoom. That is true. What we have found is that over a period of, of events, the people that come online will eventually be get busy and you'll see, you'll see a huge drop off by 50, 60% of them over time because they just, it's slowly because what happens is, is they still will feel on the outside and it's very subconscious and they, they don't complain about it. They think it's, they'll tell you that it's great in the reviews and then they just don't come to the next one. And, and you just slowly see this bleed out that, that happens over it. Whereas Oftentimes with digital only events, if you do them well, you can get to, a, they can be far less expensive and you can, you can actually build a very, very um, dedicated group of people um, to be, to be part of those. But, but it's not, it's, it's what I'm talking about is something we've seen over the last decade because we've been doing hybrid events for a long time and you just see a bleed out of your, of your online audience. Um, if you, if you, if you're going to have an event, have a digital version of it and a physical version of it. But when you mix the two together, the folks in the room are going to feel like it's great. And the people outside will eventually stop coming, you know, not, not all of them, but like 70% over a year or two. Chris. As I get older, I like using history to have discussions. Um, in the late nineties, when mini DV was introduced, it was, it was a bad format. It was just a bad format. It didn't have the color blah, blah, blah. It was bad. And yet every producer I, I knew wanted to work with it. And I knew people at that time who said, I'm not going to do that. I don't do that. I only do quality. I'm not going to work with this bad format. And they went on to selling um, RVs instead of <laughs> doing video and film production. And so it, I, I agree that the hybrid thing is wrought with problems, horrible problems. But it doesn't mean that we as technology providers can't stretch ourselves and try and find ways to give somebody what they want, even if it's not the best thing for them, because I can't control your decisions, but I can give you an invoice at the end of the project. I do at least one hybrid event a, a month. Like, you know, like, like, just to, just to be clear, no, I like, I don't, I don't get, I don't get into this conversation with clients. I'm just saying it's a bad idea. But when they say, I want to do a hybrid event, I said, uh, here's, here's the bid <laughs> you know, and, and I'm, I'm happy to, I'm happy to do it. It's your, it's right. your nickel. Right. And I'm, and I, and I don't argue with them at all about it. Um, you know, I, so, so I, so I do at least a hy one hybrid event and I just feel the same way every single time I do it, but I, yeah. but I get it done and we do it well and it looks good and sounds good and everything works. And, you know, so I, 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 uh, I do all kinds of hybrid events and I just know that they're, I just can see what's happening while I'm working on it. But I and think then, from the, the big picture, sorry, one last thing from the big picture, this is a good thing to look at. There are, there will be many times in our career where our clients ask us to do things that are horrible ideas. It doesn't mean you can't take their money at the end uh, of the day. 90% <laughs> of the work that I've done in the last 10 years has been somewhere between uh, misguided and horrible, <laughs> like you know, like so. And, and 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 I and I my my job was just to make it work the the technically and creatively as 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 well as it possibly can. And just what I was going to say to Chris's point is, as the question asks, like, what how should Hazmat present himself? Well, at the end of the day, the client's going to do what the client wants to do. Our responsibility is to present them with the case studies. So if there are any examples that you can find of hybrid that worked well or did not have that stuff prepared to show them. And then if they still want to go ahead with the hybrid, all of your um everything that you've thought about, then you present that in your wrap up and sharing that because the data will always prove itself. And most importantly, find out what their objections are. Why do they want to do hybrid? So then that will just help you have a more informed decision. Next question. 
Next one comes up from um, David Paskin in Miami, Florida, and it says there is an amazing new initiative from Eyewitness at USC where you can have an AI conversation with a Holocaust survivor. Do you see a future for this integration of AI and online events? And he's got a link to it. David. So I just learned about this last week. Um, this is, um, it's the USC Shoah Foundation. Um, and basically what they do is they take, they ask a thousand questions to a Holocaust survivor. They record each answer in individual video clips. And then they create this, I guess you would call it AI experience where you can at, type in a question or speak a question. Um, you're not gonna hear the audio, but um, he actually answers the question live. Now, this has mostly been put out in um, museums and educational institutions. I'm curious if there's, if you see a place for this kind of AI technology uh, in in virtual or digital events. Mitchell. Yeah, David, that's a great application because we're losing those people from World War II that can uh, recount those stories. So this is a great way to be able to do it. But imagine going into the Hall of Presidents at Disney World or Disneyland and having a conversation with a former president. Um, it would have to be a pretty sophisticated AI, but the motion plus the sound would be a very interesting interaction, particularly uh, for kids. Definitely. Chris? Yeah, David, I, I heard about this a month or so ago, and um, it's super interesting the way they do it because the I, I heard an interview with the producers of it, and they said that their own experience sitting down with these people was just really uh, spectacular because they got to spend so much time with these people. And yes, they do have a formula for how they do it and how they parse the stuff and how they bring it all together. And then how they um, take various questions and um, uh, meld them down to, oh, well, that would be this answer. It's, it's a, a super interesting project. I, I think I heard it on... Um, like 60 minutes or something like that. Yeah, that's what they're saying. That. You should look it up. In the chat, there's a link in the chat someone put before uh, John did. Bill? And I'm pretty sure, I am i don't think I'm mistaken about this. This was this has been going on for about a decade or more. Steven Spielberg was one of the really driving forces behind the early days of this. And I just give him props for the prescience to understand, to start back when he started and make sure this material remains viable for history. I think that was a brilliant move on his part. So thank you, Steven. And thank you, David. Next question. Joaquin Matos in Imperial Valley, California says, I'm having a weird use case where I need to send an AWS media live source to an input on a local vMix instance. How can I do this? The highest quality is preferable. The amount of latency, not so much of a concern. Jonas? So if it's a media live source and it's happened to be an encoder that's entitled to media live, I would look into Media Connect and see if you can get SRT out of that or 6 -E and then bring it down to your local instance that way. Um, they have a free 6C decoder that uh, decodes the 6C stream into a TS stream that you then can use on almost every encoder that uh, decoder that there is, and also in vMix. The other um, way would be to use UDP to a cloud instance, but then you would uh, need to keep that cloud closed. So you put the vMix instance in the cloud and then stream it down. And the third way, that I haven't tried, but in theory should work according to the docs is you can create a stat max for in AWS, send it into the stat max, take out one of the programs of the stat max into SRT and send it down. All a bit of a conundrum I would really like for Media Live to add SRT output. Next question. I just want to say it's so great when Jonas is here. Right. So excited. <laughs> it's like Jonas is here on a Monday. Uh, Craig McFarland <laughs> in Boston, the USA, comes up next. Did anyone notice any notable improvements in Apple's Keynote 12.0 that came out a few weeks ago other than the shortcuts issue? Jason. Yeah, Craig, because um, in Keynote, there's a shared code base between Mac OS and iOS, a lot of what they were doing was behind the scenes. So um, the, the changes in iOS are much bigger. You can zoom up to 400%. Of course, that means you need to update the code. Same deal with font sizes. You can go down now to the hundredths place. They wanted it to be completely uniform between Mac OS and, uh, and iOS. So that was the change. Next question. Scott. 
Jeff, it looks like, or Goff in Jackson, Tennessee, says, I have an M1 Mac Mini that needs to feed audio to a mixer and pro presenter to three older projectors, OBS and a Blackmagic switcher. The projectors don't like the signal. Any thoughts on a fix without buying new projectors? Next. Uh, sorry, Jason. Ah, the ornery projector problem. Yes, this is definitely an issue. Uh, I would start with an up-down cross and just simply figure out what works on the projector, albeit, you know, VGA, HDMI, whatever, it doesn't matter, but completely lock whatever you're using output and use a dedicated converter. Mitchell? A lot of stuff got lost on the older projectors when they went from uh, 1.X to 2.X HDMI specification. And uh, I would say anytime somebody says they have an old projector, I bring a decimator because you need something that can sort the problem out. Noah. I see two two parts of this question. So the first is the audio, right? So you need to get that out of the Mac Mini. I would advise some sort of interface like a Scarlett 2i2 that can take that audio and put it in analog, and then you can just take an XLR into your audio mixer. And then as far as video goes, like the other folks mentioned, um, you got to figure out what your port is, DV, DVI, VGA, composite, right, and get it to the right port. Um, I like distributors of some sort, like a smart video hub, um, or even a deck link out of your um, computer that has multiple outputs. That way you can route that to your destinations. Next question. Jeffrey Powers in Madison, Wisconsin. Is there a field monitor with LUT where it can be passed through HDMI out to a switcher? I want to add a camera LUT to a PTZ camera for live streaming. Jonas? I don't have a solution with a monitor, but I have here a couple solutions that scale because they don't have a monitor. The Azure LUT box is a great piece for that. You can uh, SDI in, SDI out, even has two SDIs in so you can fail over. Um, that will get you a lot on there. Then the newer 12G uh, bi-directional converters from Blackmagic, also a great solution. Um, I would choose one of those. In my mind, it doesn't make sense to add the overhead of a screen if you don't need to monitor that signal. I would monitor it down chain or before the conversion, but not at the conversion. John? Yeah, I agree. The AJA LUT box is great to use. Um, you could feed that into your monitor if you wanted to, if you wanted to see that. Um, but that's the product I use often for that. Noah. The only monitor I've known and used with LUTs um, are the Atomos Shogun. I have a bunch of them um, and I do a very light LUT as well. But yeah, if you want a cheaper option, the Blackmagic converters, definitely the newer ones have the uh, ability to load LUTs as well. And Jeffrey. Yeah, how I use the field monitor is to actually see the uh, see the PTZ camera because the PTZ camera doesn't have an LCD on it, so I can actually position where the where the PTZ camera goes. So I kind of need that monitor, but uh, it yeah, it'd be nice to pass the lot. So I'll give those a try and, and see what we could do. Alex, I believe that the Blackmagic uh, 12K also has a, a LUT insertion ability. Next question. Matt Halverson in Brooking, South Dakota says, is there, what is the rule for using a rim light for somebody that's bald? I have a small light source without the option to get a larger one and it shines off their head. Should I just shut it off? Mitchell? Well, those of us who are follically challenged, as I am, um, I, you know, they call it a hair light too. Um, and sometimes you don't have the hair to have the light flash up, but you do get the specular that you see above my finger. And that sometimes helps to round it out and make it, uh, give it some dimensionality instead of being completely flat. So is there a rule of thumb? Uh, I, I don't, I don't think so, but just in general, yeah, to get a little, get a little, get a little flash on that forehead. Alex? I like to think of it as follically aerodynamic, but anyway, so the, um, uh, but uh yeah, exactly. Go through very fast. Uh, the I would think about diffusion as well. So think about something that you might be able to take that small light and then get something like, um, you know, a diffusion, some film or 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 some some type of diffuser, and that might be a one by one foot or or, or larger, depending on how bright your your um, source is. You hit that, and then it'll make it a lot larger. And when we're dealing with folks that have less hair on their head. We typically um, try to get the largest source we can. You don't need very much power because you're not, it's not a key light. It's just there to, to add some, some highlights. So oftentimes you can take a small source and diffuse it a lot um, into a, a much larger source and it's going to give you the highlight that you need um, right over. Uh, we oftentimes put it right over top uh, to, to make that work. And Bill. 
I don't set a rim light for a group interview unless I know the person, because if someone calls up, comes up who is follically challenged without also setting up a C-stand, an arm, the proper weight on it, and a flag. What I want with a rim light is not just the head. The head We think about hair light, but I consider it an outline light for the whole upper body. So I want that light on the shoulders, particularly if they're dark against a dark background. But if it's a problem with the head, I will move a large flag to cut that light right off their head and still leave it on the rest of them and their shoulders. So if you're going to do a backlight and you're going to do a good job, also set up a flag on a stand. Next question. Guy Cochran in Seattle, Washington. What's the best Superstore layout for two talking heads and a live feed? Chris? Well, Guy, best is a scary word. Um, I would go for a screen that is a 48 by 9 aspect ratio and just put all three side by side. You asked for best. Um, how how do you literally say? I mean, it, re- it totally depends. Mickey, it depends. I don't know, probably, you know, two over here and then a a bigger one for the feed, but 48 yeah. by nine is a really hip aspect ratio that all the kids are doing it. Noah. Let's bring it back to 16 by nine. <laughs> yeah. The stacked um, on the side and then the bigger live feed, I think is, is generally the best layout um, for the cyber rodeo, which we'll talk about in a little bit. We did something a little bit different because we had um, two hosts in the same room. So we basically split the feed and had uh, Zach and Jesse on either side with the live video in the middle. The main reason for that creative move um, was I've seen hundreds of hours of their show um, with them in the same box next to each other. And so it was the first time we separated them and introduced um, kind of a new character to the show. And that's why we went with that creative choice. Nice. Jeffrey. Yeah, I like that creative choice, especially because of the fact that they were both looking at the camera because then you could split it off and and it looks like two separate feeds. But uh, it really depends on where, if you're talking one host, two guests, or all three are are equal or or whatnot. And if you're using separate cameras, if you're pointing towards their face rather than uh, side profile or something like that, uh, then uh, yeah, what I would do is I would would plan for how that gets, uh, how you have the setup there uh, if you want them to be more equal or if you want them to be more of a, uh, of, I'm trying to think of the words here, but uh, you get the idea where you can have a, a larger for the host and a smaller for the, uh, for the guests or vice versa. Next question. Next one comes to us from uh, Douglas Carmichael. One of my most memorable concert experiences was attending a local festival and seeing the audience audience miraculously start dancing when the drums popped out once the engineer engaged the SSL master bust compression. It was an Allen Smart C2. Why could that be? Alex? People really depend on those drums to know <laughs> where the beat is, you know. So, so if you're if you're really if you're really good at it, you don't need that, and you'll understand where you are in the in the thing, and you can hear that beat to you. But for the, for the average person, uh, they will kind of mosey around and not do anything until they hear a solid beat that they can dance to, and and then that lets them build uh, where the bars are, where all the other bits and pieces are. So, so yeah, so that's that's why everyone started to move was because they actually understood where they were. John. Yeah, I think it also comes into like how much energy are you putting into the mix? Um, and so what is that emotion? What are you driving from that? Um, this is why, you know, it's not set and forgetting with mixing. You're actually creating the environment with the, what, how you're mixing the music um, and then uh, establishing an a, ability for people to follow along. Like Alex said, is they need something to tie themselves to. That's something that's going to pop along, easy to hear, and it makes it a lot easier to dance to. Mitchell. Uh, that solid state logic uh, studio compressor is well known from their 4000 series way back in the uh, 80s and 90s. And it's, uh, it's, it's well suited to miking drums. And sometimes if you're miking drums, they could can sound kind of anemic. If you put a proper compression on it, the ring out and the, the overall effect of the uh, compressor being on there makes it big. So that might also inspire people to, to get on the good foot. Bill. And low end just moves people. I was never in a dance club situation that didn't have a subwoofer as one of the first things they bought because um, it just moves people. So there you go. And Chris. Uh, you know, a good friend of mine who used to make a whole lot of live music, he said, look, live music is totally easy. You stand here, they stand in front of you. You push these faders up and play with them until everybody's head is doing this. You go home. It's easy. <laughs> Next question. 
Douglas Carmichael says, why would the PSSI 090 transmission rack, and he's got a link there, uh, use a hollowed out Cat5 panel and not a proper patch panel? Tucker? Yeah, so looking at those patch panels, and I, I did pull up the rack, um, a lot of times inside of racks, we're, we're always managing failure points. Um, that's one piece of it. Um, the other piece of it is going to be that we have to put lids on these cases, and typical patch panels don't leave space um, for you to put a lid on. Uh, and as far as um, back to managing failure points, you basically have the failure point of the connector that's inside the case to the equipment. Then you have the failure point on the back of a patch panel if you have a typical patch panel. And then you have a failure point coming out of that or two failure points coming out of that um, going into the switch. So we cut those down a lot by going directly from the gear through the brush panel. That's uh, if you look at brush panels, that's what they are. Um, and then directly to the switch. John. Tucker to answer that perfectly. Thank you. Next question. Douglas Carmichael says, what is the best course to take to start learning Amazon Web Services? I can't speak to whether it's the best course, but I get a lot of emails from edX. Um, also, I think AWS, if you navigate on their, their website as well, that they have some, some courses too. So edX is one that I get a lot of messages from. All right. Well, we finished our, our first hour on time. Thank you so much to our producers for your questions. Now we're going to change over to talk about Cyber Rodeo. And we had a team that actually produced uh, a show. And I'm going to ask um, Jonas and Josh and Noah to, to talk to us about what that was like, that experience was like. Sure. Yeah. Thanks for having us, Liberty, and the team. Um, we're super excited. Um, the The only thing, um, I, and this is partly my fault, I didn't follow up fast enough, but obviously the event was about a month ago now, um, just under that, like four weeks or so. Um, and so, yeah, we had a lot of fun producing the event. Um, it was similar to NAB, and it was kind of like the sequential step of um, Cyber Rodeo helped contribute to the NAB stream that we did last week. And so all of these things are learning steps and um, things we can do to develop um, our skill set. And so like the NAB show, there is a team of people, um, lots and lots of people helping out. And so Tucker, um, you know, Jeff, Jonas, um, John, uh, sorry, Josh, Bill Davis. So, so all these people and more were involved uh, with the show. So I just want to cover a couple quick things before we get into like the highlight video. Um, the first thing is we know Tesla and specifically Elon Musk is it, essentially a political figure at this point. So like that can be a divisive topic in itself. So we're not necessarily promoting or not promoting Elon Musk, right? So we're setting that aside and we're focused on the show proper, right? And how that went along. Um, and secondly, we were not the Tesla hired team. We were actually a second team um, su that supported a YouTube channel that does coverage on Tesla. So just wanted to clarify that. So, um, but the event itself, um, there. The Cyber Rodeo was the grand opening of the uh, Tesla Giga Factory, um, which is an 11 million square foot building, one of the biggest buildings in the world of its kind. Um, and yeah, so they're going to be producing cars and at its peak, it's going to be over a million uh, vehicles a year uh, that it's going to be producing. And so this event basically was the grand opening and they invited people within the Tesla community to come out and um, celebrate that opening and also see the engineering and the facility, um, the innovation that's happening within Tesla. So that's kind of what the uh, event in, in, in was celebrating or, or focused on. And so our part was uh, we did a secondary experience with these uh, YouTubers, Zach and Jesse uh, from the Now You Know channel. Um, and so we set up a live stream that lasted six and a half hours um, and we had lots of great <laughs> connections and people that were involved with that. So. Um, yeah, before I go any further, let's go ahead and roll that video and take a look at what the event looked like. Or be um, crappy. We were going to have people just filming and uploading footage so we could still see it, but it looks like we have a Patreon question, I'm being told. All right. Exciting. Let's do it. I love Patreon questions because that means we get to give away a shaver. Hello, what's your question? I'm curious what you guys think about um, how it's going to run battery wise. Um, and. The polls that we've run. Oh, yeah. So, Bobby, tell us about your band, hey first of all. <laughs> yeah. Oh, we've got a tweet here. Uh, invite no longer <laughs> needed. Come on over, y'all. Wow. There we go. Yeah. So, we're coming up on this live stream here. <laughs> Brian Kent with excellent humor. 
Oh, there, there's there. Wow, he filled in. Nice. <laughs> this is awesome. Wow. Oh, man, this is going to be great. This is such a good juxtaposition oh. between their stream and, yeah. and what's actually going on, on the ground. This is and, great. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> this is inside. So, okay, now we have another shot uh, Yeah, here. we're just left of the stage. Jameson, thank you so much. This is epic. Kat, thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Whoa. <laughs> 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 That's that's the uh, when I ordered my Model Three. That's what I got to see. Welcome to Cyber Audio. Kind of missed opportunity to redeem themselves, but I mean, maybe they just said, you know, it doesn't make any sense to. Fireworks. Fire. Here we got fireworks. So we got drones and fireworks. Right. You know, there was no Cybertruck. There was yeah. no uh, full self-driving robotaxi. There was yeah. no Tesla bot. Oh, this is great. We got that screenshot pulled oh, up. Oh, yeah. Let's take a look at Let's that. Let's go full screen on this. I did not. Yeah. It was always a chore. <laughs> you know, but that... Four. I mean... Oh, there's hey, Noah. There we go. Asian. And so before you know it, we have, gosh, close to 20 people on the back end just helping in different wow. ways, shape, or forms. And, uh, yeah, it's been really fun to see it all come together. In the background, because we have this uh, comm system here, mm -hmm. you're talking on multiple channels to all. There's all the yeah. people talking and all at the same time, but we don't, like, get bothered by them because they're all in their own little place. All right. So we will see you all later. Signing off. Good night. Now you know. So I guess that's how you put six and a half hours in two minutes, <laughs> two and a half minutes. So lots of stuff there, obviously a lot of stuff out of play, um, out of context, but that's totally fine. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Jonas to talk about the engineering and the back end side of how this all came together. Yeah, I, I somehow got pulled into this. Uh, I think we were about a week or maybe even 10 days out. Um, and we had this big idea of making um, a whole remote contribution workflow working and not only have all the remote contributors, but also um, Noah was gonna drive there with all his equipment. And when we were like, I think we can do that smarter. And we uh, started building out the cloud system. Um, in the end, the cloud system was built to be agile because it's a six hour stream, something's gonna go wrong and something's gonna go change. As soon as we're live, we're live and we have to be able to take a hit and take um, a beating if there's something going wrong without anyone noticing. So what we had, we had a couple of roles that were interfacing with the system that got their own uh, interface. Um, Jeff was DDing, so he was in Zoom, got the multi-view, normal multi-view like you would know it, and then um, had a companion panel that he was local to him. So he had companion buttons to press. Um, the preset was a little more complicated for this one because we had um, inserts and you basically the TD had two additional MEs, one for the graphics where he could cut between the different graphics channels. We had a graphics red and blue, and then we also had a social media graphic that we could put in there. And then we had a multiple contribution points where people could contribute to us too. And we also could cut between those so we could um, go from one person to the other person without changing the overlay or anything. And then the other thing also was uh, obviously reliability is a big thing if you are going live six hours. So we had redundancy built in, we had um, we minimized the failure points and we didn't lose a frame according to our statistics, which is always great to say. Um, Taka helped me on the all audio part. We had a pretty advanced audio system throughout all those different people on the different buses and uh, we made it all work. Yeah. Nice. All right, John. First off, hats off to the guys. I, I watched the first couple of hours, then I watched the real, the the not real, but the Tesla uh, show, which wasn't as good as your show. And then for the final end, I came back to you guys and watched it. You guys did a terrific, terrific job. I've been watching now, you know, guys, this is father son team and uh, they're Tesla experts and they did a really good job hosting as well. It was a well done job, guys. Hats off. Noah. Thanks, John. Yeah, it was it was definitely a fun experience. Um, I, I kind of said a few things in the beginning, um, so I, I think I'll kick it back off to either Jonas or Alex. Jonas? Yeah, I think uh, we're ready for some questions. Um, we can uh, go through a couple of the things. We had uh, multiple contribution methods. We had um, 
more than 20 people working on this and we had a graphic station that was remotely um but basically all the equipment was in the cloud and managed by us so um there was no reliance on there it worked really smooth from our end we like always you want a little more time just a little more time um we run out of the time but uh, yeah maybe Josh can uh, explain a little more about the contribution and the statistics yeah uh alex i'm just gonna run, go to josh so that he can can chime in to just what that looked it looked great like that video even though it was just a recap video uh just everything's so smooth and the audio was pristine josh yeah, just a little context of what you were seeing. So as Noah mentioned, um, this wasn't the official uh, Tesla broadcast. This, These were uh, a channel that uh, had about 300K uh, subscribers themselves, and they focus on Tesla specifically. So um, they mostly did a lot of um, pre-produced content. So they were kind of uh, pushing out into doing the live stream. And I'm sure Noah can talk more about how he, uh, how he pitched that. But the statistics of it is that, like you Noah know, mentioned, it was a six and a half hour stream, uh, which worked well because the team was very dynamic and were able to play off each other. Um, and uh, the crew and the team, which included um, their own editing crew, editing team, which was able to feed them content, and we were able to feed them contributors and content so that they could keep uh, rolling off of the, the new fresh uh, information that we were sending to them. Um, they were able to to carry the stream and it went really well. It didn't really seem like they had to stretch all that often. Um, we had about uh, one tenth of the viewership of the official Tesla stream uh, at its peak. I believe it was about nine and a half uh, thousand live viewers at the time. And I forget the, the statistic for the, the overall uh, group, but um, the interest of the stream i think really showed through as we were kind of keeping an eye on the live viewers and even when the official stream um, started to teeter off and ended um, they were able to retain a lot of their viewership and after the, the official stream ended they continued on they still had about six six thousand viewers afterwards so it uh, they really felt it was a really positive uh, engagement when um, they were focused more um, previously about the pre-produced content. So this is a, a good live stream experience for them. And Alex? And all I wanted to point out is that something that John said. Once an, another feedback I got from NAB is that they liked our stream, you know, better than almost all, well, all the other streams that they saw coming out of NAB. And there's something about us, you know, I think that there's something that we're, we're going to keep on experimenting with, with the upcoming events, but there's something about a bunch of people that are passionate about doing this and just figuring it out that is a little bit more fresh and a little bit more fun than what, when, when, even when I start doing, when you start doing a big event for a corporation, you start, you know, there's a lot of, um, doing things in a certain normal way that people understand rather than being edgy. And I think that we're able to experiment in a way that we can't that oftentimes even I can't when I'm doing it for a large corporation. Yeah, very true. And then you guys mentioned that there were um, Noah, Josh, Jonas. So the graphics, they had a team creating content. So some of those graphics, were you involved in that as well? Or that was just all coming from their, their end? Yeah, that's a good question. So they had a, their color scheme and some base graphics um, that they built for us. And then the execution of those graphics were Jonas and the team. Um, was there more to that, Jonas, or is that pretty accurate? No, we basically got all the assets and then compiled the uh, uh, vMix preset. It was a pretty extensive, so we um, can go to different things. We were prepped if they get, um, if Elon Musk decides to join, we were prepped for that case. We had a plan for that. Um, if there's another VIP joining, we had a plan for that. Um, just to plan out for a lot of stuff and then to keep it stable. Um, some of the things that I often notice when people program vMix presets, it's, it's easy to get lost in triggers and like clever script automation, but in six hours, I need to know if I press this button, this exact thing is gonna happen now at the start of the stream, but also six hours in. And one of the, and that's how the whole preset was built. It was built deterministic. So every time I go to one scene, it's always the same state that vMix will be in if this scene goes live. So we had um, the audio automated within with a complex audio for this video that uh, took buses with itself. So it muted and unmuted the correct people and then uh, 
Taka augmented that with our um, remote control of the audio to do a little fade up and fade down so it's not a harsh cut when we cut to the next scene. Um, and that worked really well. Uh, from the content, we also had a lot of support from their team. Uh, an opener, a really nice stinger. We had um, ads. So during the breaks, we had ads that they produced for their different channels and the sponsors that we showed, which was really fun. Um, and then we had their whole editing team with us the six hours. So there was a constant chatter of like, hey, I found a tweet. Somebody put that into After Effects, rendered it out, sent it to us, play out, uh, played it out. Um, there was like, hey, we got this and this footage from the factory. Um, one really great thing that was shown on after the stream where you see the screenshot is while they were still streaming, we were able to pull out content out of the existing stream. And as soon as it was over and the fireworks started, we were able to say like, hey, and now we're ready to review what we just watched again and look at all the key details. Um, what I think was a really nice thing because sometimes you can miss a little things. But we had uh, three of their editors with us that, who were just searching for like, oh, that little thing could be missed. Let's play it again. Um, that was really great. And the whole integration um, between the team and us worked really well. Uh, we had Bobby from the team suddenly join on to uh, give a like, hey, we're here from the back end. We just confirmed that this tweet is false and stuff like that. Um, it was really fun in that way. But uh, that's how we did the content. That's awesome. So you basically gave them primetime sports at the, for six hours, just bringing that that key content and giving them playbacks. That's awesome. Noah? Yeah, from like a structural standpoint, the conversation was basically the hosts, like Zach and Jesse were going to be there and we were going to feed them content consistently. So we were going to find it or try to bring them live feeds tweets, you know, uh, photos on Instagram, whatever we could find, and basically just feed them as fast as we could as often as possible. And so when I think of a show like this, like it ultimately comes down to those foot foundational building blocks of what builds up a show. And, and so um, obviously we had the editors, which were a huge help, right? You know, just described that we have the anchors at the desks, right? The hosts who glue it all together. And then we have the community that we're trying to connect to. Um, yeah. One of the themes really from OH space to cyber rodeo to NAB is the flexibility um, and the agileness that we have as an office hours community to be able to um, adapt quickly and move quickly. And then the combination of all these ideas and people multiplying each other. I've said that before, it's, it's super exciting. But um, one of the things I, I guess got a little bit of joy out of, um, and thankfully we didn't have to go too far into this, but um, was the feast or famine mentality of um, you got to plan for as many um, high likely variables as possible. And so we we're kind of planning for both feast and famine. Like if we got um, Elon Musk or if we got several, you know, hundred contributors, we had a pipeline for that. And we also had the opposite of like what it would look like if we only had a few contributors. And uh, unfortunately we had just a few on this one, but we still um, were able to make a solid show out of it. So, yeah. Great. Let's jump into these questions. Our first one is from Guy Cochran in Seattle, and he says, what did the cloud infrastructure look like for the cyber rodeo? Jonas. So I'm, so I'm going to describe it from the interfaces that the technician worked with. So we had um, Jeff Whitgren as a TD and Noah as the show caller. They both joined the Zoom. In the Zoom meeting, we then use a custom language that's called production for the translation feeds. And that's how they get um, the production sound from the vMix engine. That way we were able to put them in the same room with the hosts and kind of keep that energy there. Everyone was, there was a production room and a contribution room. So the hosts could see the multi-view, but we had a special feed just for the tech directors. Um, then the other interface that we had, obviously for Taka and I as the two engineers on this project, Taka had um, his X keys and remotely had faders into vMix. We were on our different instances. We had um, multiple instances up to get the job done. We had uh, Zoom rooms for the contribution method that we are all managed by us. And then we um, we also had a vMix instance that was just for graphics. There we uh, enabled Parsec and NiceDCV access to uh, manage that remotely and then uh, set up the connectivity between all that to make the NDI flow. Next question. Next one comes to us from Chris Widener in Lafayette, Indiana. He says, it was fun working on the Cyber Rodeo on productions like this. What could we look at next time to streamline short clip playback? The Google Doc works, but was always in motion to do the shorter clips. Jonas. 
Yeah, I think it's one of the things that we underestimated how often we can push out content and how fast the editors were with pushing out content. And um, we probably should have uh, worked more on that sync method, but since we weren't sure what we're going to do for that till I think probably two hours before we went live, um, we went with the Dropbox and having links there method will uh, definitely have a, a player solution that's built for that for the next one. Alex? You know, for edit edits, do we think that something like camera to cloud would be something useful for us to use to, to have people like generating content that's immediately available to the editors or almost immediately available? Would that be? I think so. And what's super interesting is like Atomos at NAB announced their uh, camera to cloud essentially infrastructure with like ProRes and that. So I'd be super interested to see how that could be possibly adapted for future events. And then obviously the Blackmagic um, uh, 12Ks, I think, now can do direct streaming. So like getting the um, feed directly out of camera, like as fast as possible would be awesome. And, and in this case, the editing was more so of like other people's videos from YouTube and within the Tesla community and then taking those into right. something on the show. But yeah, both, I think. I think it could be interesting on the ground of being able to generate content and have it just be from phones, from we get some Teradex, get some other things and be constantly pushing that content, you know, potentially up, up to the cloud and have people cutting it, cutting it quickly. Yeah, yeah. I think if we have our own team there, that will be definitely something that would be really cool. I mean, a kind of crazy thing with this one is we had a remote team that we never met. We had a one preference meeting with them, but since we couldn't get any of our people in, into the actual facility since it was a private party, um, we weren't able to like prep them with that kind of thing. Um, I think that would be really cool. One thing that we didn't set up just um, budget and time constraints was um, a live recorder that uh, records growing files that we could have done. And then we could have just edited the live stream and do a highlight reel and also edit the Tesla live stream live, um, which just run them out. Adobe did a, a video last week. It's on their Facebook page during NAB, just talking about the cloud to camera workflow. And they had, I can't remember which team it was, um, which sports team, but they had the social media people there talking about how they were able to use, I want to say it was Frame.io and just walking through that. So it's definitely that, Alex, that's a great idea with the, the clam, camera to cloud concept. Um, Josh. Yeah, and since the Chris had asked about, and Chris ran our uh, graphics in, um, he asked about the document. The document that we used, we knew we wanted something to be able to uh, coordinate everyone to be on the same page, um, and that's what the document was originally thought to do. And uh, it quickly grew and morphed, uh, even in in show, to being different things. So. Um, we might look at either making the document better as far as just keeping the hosts up, uh, being able to, to show them what was used. I think um, that they um, weren't looking at that as much as what we had intended for that to be something to sort of show the whole crew is this is where we're going next. But then um, it might be different than the pipeline that we actually use to bring the short clips in. Bill? And at my piece of this, I was essentially in the green room looking for contributors who are coming in via various things and then uh, sending them to a screener who would make sure that we had all their information and then hopefully go on to the show. That was the idea in the beginning. What I saw is that the contribution uh, consistency and things was all over the place. Particularly, we'd get a really good shot from uh, inside the factory or something like that for a little bit. We'd put it through the system, be ready to go to it, and it would fall apart part as anybody moved anywhere. So uh, the idea of phone contribution and things like that and trying to imagine that you're away from the bonded cellular teams that you're sending out that have a better chance of getting through, I just don't think is quite there yet. Maybe in other circumstances, there will be more robust connectivity. But we had a lot of things that got 80% of the way through the vetting process that could have been a contribution, but fell apart at the last minute. That's just the landscape that we're working in now. It, they still had a great system. And if we'd had 100 phones coming in, I truly think we could have managed that successfully because of the guys planning this ahead of time. They they really did plan for at scale success and not at scale. But the technical side of that was a challenge. And Noah. 
Yeah, maybe Josh, you could speak to this a little bit about our infrastructure. And we we overplanned or over engineered a little bit in that sense, but um, I think it was worth the thought um, exercise at least. So Josh, you wanna tell us a little bit about what that looked like? Sure, I'll help the guys out in the back by raising my hand. And um, yeah, so um, we had planned for feast or famine, like Noah had said. So in a feast scenario, we had several different breakout rooms from our main contribution room where we would send people to screeners. And then ideally they would um, record in our general document that was globally available, dynamically updated they would um, put in the interesting uh, little slug of what that contributor was wanting to contribute. And so in a, in a world where we had several things to choose from, um, the, um, the hosts could basically choose your own adventure where they could see all of these possible contributions floating up to the top that were being inputted by the people screening. Uh, the potential contributors, and then saying, oh yeah, that's where we want to go to. Let's bring in that person and talk about that system. So in a, in a feast scenario, we tried to, to plan for ways to which we could have a broad enough audience. And I would say too that, I think I mentioned um, briefly about our volunteers, there were about five in the original crew that included uh, the hosts and the editing team and about 15 so uh, around 20 people uh, total um, and i attribute that to um, when people heard about the event they were excited about it and wanted to help out so we did have a lot of people like bill and others that uh, volunteered to be these screeners to where we could send people into the room they could see what um, what um, relevant content they would have and then put that up as a contribution as someone we could go to and then when they were ready to contribute we put them into the main room which would be able to pin them and bring them in uh, for NDI into the system and we had uh, someone there the producer that could guide them and say okay you're going to go on right now go ahead and because of the system uh, we could do that type of wrangling without fear of uh, the wrangler coming into program so that's the way that we planned and sort of the feast and famine we we mentioned as to noah um, we tend to be more on the on the famine side of things but the content contributors that we had were enough uh, for our um, for our, our crew to be able to carry things along and bill I just wanted to mention one of the charming pieces that we did manage to get there. Our own Paul Wallace was outside the front gates and they went to do a remote from him and it just kind of sparkled up because he was inside the crowd. There was a lot of energy, a lot of dynamics. I think the hosts really loved having that on the scene reporter kind of feeling there. And it was just a different thing than we've been seeing up to that point in there to have a live out from the front gates person on the ground contributing into the mix. Next question. Next question comes to us from uh, Jeff Reland in Indianapolis. He said, what was the single biggest challenge to overcome for the cyber rodeo? Noah. Oh, yeah, definitely lots of challenges. Um, I guess the biggest hurdle was probably the Internet when you have such a large building um, and very little to no cell coverage. Uh, it was very spotty, so that hit or missed pretty much the whole time. Um, we did hear that there could have been some sort of Wi-Fi set up um, with with Tesla because um, they might have had something, but that was never um, conveyed to us and set up ahead of time. So maybe if we do another event there, we'll talk to them about that. But really for me, the bigger challenge was my own mindset. Um, I went in with the expectation of doing a traditional setup, right, with my gear and cameras and driving to Austin, which um, I roughly budgeted like three or five grand or so just to make that trip and come out. And we were gonna partner with a local bar and, and do an in-person meetup or what have you. Um, and then after talking to Josh and Jonas a little bit more, um, they essentially pitched or, or talked to um, me into considering, hey, why don't, why don't we do a cloud-based infrastructure? And it was something that um, obviously we've been talking about on office hours for a long time, um, but that was like the first time for me to say, let's commit to a virtual first kind of setup. Um, and that kind of allowed us to rethink and re-brainstorm around what this I, um, what this event could be, what the show could be. Um, and I think it, it lit a fire in us and, and started something cool and interesting. So. Josh? That's a tough one for the single, but so I'll say the single uh, largest challenge was the unknown. There's a lot of unknowns. 
um, the um, hosts that we have were very dynamic. They were rock stars. They, they were really dynamic father son team and they could carry really well, which was great. But um, we had never worked with them before. And we hadn't really done this type of contribution before where people would come in and we would try to pull them and then see how the process would be to you know, put them onto air, um, how the team would interact. Um, we theorized a lot of things. We tried to plan for, you know, um, the feast or famine, you know, contingency plans of things. Uh, went wrong, but um, the, I'd say the biggest challenge is the unknown, and you you don't find that out till you till you do it. Right. Next question. Next one comes from Noah Sargent in Fullerton, in California. What did you learn working on this project? Noah, this is a question I definitely ask myself, so I, I'll answer it too. And feel free to chime in if anybody else wants to. Um, I feel like the the thing I learned is uh, you got to have people around you that you trust and that you can build relationships with. And um, that's the power of office hours and um, having Josh and Jonas and the rest of the team just be there and um, have wondrous skills that like amplified everything uh, I did was awesome. Um, I think just going back to, you don't know what you don't know, like until you do it and practice it. Right. And so um, I think it just reemphasized that we need to get the reps in with these kind of kinds of events. And so, that's why I'm excited about Cine Gear and NAB and our, our NAM and the other things that are coming up because we get possible chances to fail, but also possible chances to learn and grow and develop. Jeff? Are you there, Jeff? Yeah. On mute. There you go. There we go. Sorry. <laughs> I would say with one of the big challenges being time, uh, and, and along with a plug for the volunteer teams coming up on, on some future shows, volunteer early. You know, I, I, I know I got in uh, a little bit later. I got in really late with the rocket launch. I decided hours before <laughs> heading to Las Vegas to head to Las Vegas. Um, you know, volunteer early so that uh, that you're as well informed and so forth as possible, so that you can be a real positive contributor. It's a, it's a great time, by the way. That's a really good point, Josh. And what we're what we're taking away from this, what we've learned is we now have something to point to. Uh, it was a, a brand new point of concept at the time when we would try to explain it when we had our meetings with the um, with the hosts to explain what this is about, how we'd like to pursue it and how things were going to go. And now we have something we can point to and say, this is how it went and then tweak the things that we would like to tweak. And then people get a, a better idea of sort of onboarding them to the concept. And Alex. Yeah, I think that. Um one thing to keep just a reminder that we are putting out in the email that goes out every morning, there's a sign up for NAM and for the um, Cinegear. And so you want to jump into that or look for those, those links there. We already have almost 25 people signed up for both of those. Um, a lot of them offsite, some, some on site. Um, and so we're going to start working on that. We're going to actually discuss those next week. This is a good prep for this, but next week we'll talk about how we're going to design those, but, um, but we'll probably send out some emails this week as well. So if you're interested in doing these, just to, just to touch on what Jeff was saying, um, definitely sign up for those and uh, be part of the, be part of the crew. Next question. Noah Sargent, Fullerton, California. What would you do differently? Mm, I'll toss that back to you, Noah. <laughs> oh, man. Um, I think getting internet connectivity, try to figure it out, um, whether that's um, Mr. Net or LiveView or whatever system we have for boots on the ground. Um, I mean, I would love to send some pro professional teams um, to those types of events. I, I feel like with NAB, we learned that having two crews was pretty crucial. Um, having, you know, one live and one prepping for the next shot uh, at a minimum. I don't know, like, if there's a maximum there, obviously we can overscale that that bandwidth too, but two seems to be a good sweet number that we'll try to land with. Um, but I feel like doing something different um, will have that chance at Cinegears, at um, NAM, at, at future events. So um, iteration's key, iteration's huge, and we'll keep trying to iterate. Josh? Yeah, kind of what Noah was saying, um, we we would, uh, having a longer lead time, we would have the opportunity to do some of the things we just didn't have time to do, um, like having specific, um, our own uh, field reporters, uh, uh, they're uh, equipped in, as opposed to um, leaning on uh, just the happenstance, whoever uh, 
whoever shows up. It was earlier in the uh, planning, we were really looking at that as the exciting element, but it's high risk, high reward, right? So you have the opportunity to pick up um, things that just happen to happen and in the moment, but having those stable anchors that you can choose to whether to go to or have the the serendipitous thing that we could we could choose would be helpful. There were different little uh, production elements that you could do with a longer lead time that we would definitely uh, do, and I'm um, sure that others can speak to that as well. Jeff? I would add that uh, I, I think there, I mean, there were quite a few, you know, volunteers and all, and some that I don't even, I never saw them, never even talked with them, but I knew they were back there working. <clears throat> but um, listen to Alex for a long time talk about, you know, the size and the numbers that are on teams and, and all the delegation that takes place and so forth. And and, I, and the one that I noticed in particular was, was Noah was wearing several hats I, I you know I mean <clears throat> listening and managing can all the calm channels and trying to call the show and so forth so you know I don't know for sure whether that was like a lack of number of volunteers or whatnot but I think a little more delegation <clears throat> to provide a, a bit more focus on those specific roles would have helped a lot next question uh, Chris Fenwick in Emeryville here on the panel for Noah. Is this preferred production mode from now on going forward, especially in regard to the dust issues? <laughs> <laughs> so many <No>. dust issues. <laughs> oh my gosh. Um, I, I think so. I think having boots on the ground teams that send back to a cloud infrastructure and that your primary hosts are on a fiber-esque connection, um, maybe even a fail-safe connection, um, seems like the winning formula. I mean, it just makes sense compared to having um, boots on the ground or um, a setup where you don't have um, reliable internet, you know? Um, and the, the footprint is also different, right? When your studio is in the same spot, ready to go, um, in a trusted spot with, you know, redundant power too, you know, like all those things, basically add to um, a more consistent, higher quality product. And, uh, you know, Alex has spoken to that as, as well. Like you keep your elbows in, right? Eliminate as many variables as you can um, and you'll move forward faster, farther. Next question. Douglas Carmichael says, how did you manage audio mixing? Hmm, Tucker. Yeah, so uh, Jonas had the workflow kind of built out as far as um, how a lot of the the actual switching and mutes and unmutes happened um i was managing at an x touch um connected to the instances and was able to do kind of some audio sweetening um so the the hosts actually sounded great coming out so i didn't need to do much there um all the contributors obviously are zoom contributors coming as they come um so there was a lot of very kind of quick workflow it wasn't like use the the premium ssl stuff it was a matter of like what's the utilitarian fast uh plugins that i can use um so that was basically it doing some you know leveling and then some eq on every channel that came in that was it sounded really good next question cherry cheetah dallas says noah what was your inspiration to pitch this event so i was a patron of the now you know channel i've been following them for a while um, and I knew that I wanted to be involved with their channel some way, shape, or form. Um, Cyber Rodeo was coming up, and the notable thing about Tesla is they are very last minute with their events. They tend to change stuff, and um, you know, var variables change or what have you. So um, the thought there was we could do this event. It's something that we might want to do, and we talked about Plan A, right, which was going in person and, and getting all set up. Um, and then when Plan B started to realize, right, the virtual cloud-based system first, um, that's when it was. Um, something that we thought we could actually do. And so it actually, it took me a little bit to solidify on that idea, like I said earlier, um, but like, I guess that helped inspire the show itself and how it grew out to be what it was uh, with remote contributors and the team that we had, the 20 or so people building on the back end to, to make it all come together. You might've said this already, but how much like total time did you have between like the idea and the yeah, actual show? That's a good question. I've been like, emailing and being in contact with them um, generally for about a year. But for the show itself, it was probably a month out. And then really it being realized was maybe three weeks away from the start. Um, okay. And then pulling in our team was shortly after that because we needed to commit to the cloud infrastructure um, before pulling more folks in from our community. Um, but 
also what's cool too is like after the OH space success, it kind of um, started that snowball and, that, and building that confidence and trust with the team of realizing that like we have this amazing community uh, of people that we can bring together to do these kind of things. And I, I think that snowball will continue to happen through the other projects. Right. Next question. Jeff Keithley, our friend in Texas, says, did you consider using a more broadcast centric contributor system like LiveView or TVU instead of Zoom? Jonas? We definitely consider there were multiple reasons why we didn't go with a more broadcast centric uh, system. Apart from this was a volunteer project, we haven't had people there that were our crew. So I don't know how many people would have feel they're comfortable renting a live view and giving it to some random person who claims to be the one that we want to have inside there and right. just trust him to come out to the right entry after six hours and not like drive home and be like, oh, what's this yellow box in my backpack? Huh. Um, and also like Zoom worked really well um, for what it did. It worked really well. We haven't, we weren't sure if we would get any better signal with live view. Um, and we, we have seen some instabilities with that um, in the past, which also made us tend to a more unbroadcasty uh, workflow. But uh, next time we'll uh, happy to uh, get one of your encoders and throw it and someone's back better and try it. Noah? So the, the fundamental building blocks of this question are like cellular, the remote kits, and then Zoom versus the cloud, right? So for cellular, we just didn't know um, if you have no signal, like in the desert, you have no cell signal. So you're trying to amplify nothing. You're still going to get nothing. So we weren't 100% sure what was going to work with that. Um, we we actually, Mr. Net was um, another partner we were considering for this project as well. But we just didn't have time and um, infrastructure to really ship and, and get that locked in before the, the start date. So, um, but yeah, having LiveView or, or some other system, we can definitely test. What would be even better is if we could partner with Tesla and figure out their Wi-Fi situation or internet situation on site. We also talked about bringing Starlink in and, and trying to do something like that. Secondly, kind of uh, connects to what we were talking about last week with the remote kits and, and looking at what people have as far as phones or you know professional cameras and having kits built out for that. Um, so we're going to keep evolving and keep iterating on that process to try to figure out what a you know um, a professional kit looks like versus like a consumer kit in that sense. And then finally, the Zoom versus like a cloud-based switching system. I know Keith Lee has um, a, a great partner that he's worked with before. So I mean. Best idea wins is what it comes down to. And uh, 2.0, you know, OH 2.0 has a great system. Uh, there's other systems out there. Um, even the one we have here is a vMix system based off of Jonas and his company. So um, it's it's just lots of interesting things to look at and um, to consider for sure. Yeah, Jeff says in the chat, we definitely need to talk ahead of the next one. So we look forward to seeing where that goes. Next question. Roscoe Jones in Brea, California, up next with how would multiple segment producers be best organized? Should they have specific areas to cover or just whatever gets assigned on the fly? Noah? Yeah, we talked about that because the facility was so large, right? So um, what it came down to was kind of a free for all. Um, and so we had some folks who were inside and some folks who were outside and people were just calling in however they could at different times. Um, so that kind of worked obviously if we had a better game plan that would that would help structure that and so when we looked at nab we tried to have that with uh jeffrey powers and and jeff keithley and we tried to have um the run of show matching that or what have you so i'm going to take a quick moment to go over our doc here which was what helped base the uh this the nab doc as well so you'll see a very similar format to like the first page which had all the connections um, or appendix, right? The click out, the links out to other things. The assets showed all of the elements that we had. And so we had a lot more edited pieces, like we said, with the um, editing team. So we did have a list of folks that helped contribute um, that connected with us ahead of time. And then we had some last minute connections as well. Um, for the credits page, you'll see it's a much longer list. And I redacted, obviously, the credentials here. Um, but you'll see that's what we had built out um, for that. Um, links pages to all the different things that we needed to link out to. Um, we did have some pre-written texts that we copy pasted a lot. And so um, the roles were a lot more involved. Um, so the different people and the different positions. One of the quick things I'll mention is like 
Um, the technical director is a different term used in different types of production too. So that was an interesting thing of like, what does that mean to somebody or what does a show caller mean to somebody and figuring that out. Um, of course, we had a rundown, even though this was very, very loose compared to other shows. Um, and then this was probably one of the more important docs that we wish uh, we utilized more. We did a little bit, but not 100%. But we called it the doc, and that's what our um, uh, our hosts would be looking at for like a choose your own adventure. So they could choose one of these three pins. And so we might have this person be at the paint shop and this person at um, the band or this or that. Like, so basically they would have these options that they could decide where to go to next. Um, and that was the, the feast scenario. Um, the famine scenario was we basically just fed them whatever we could build them. So um, we also had a VIP guest list of, of people that we might see and then a vMix instance, which I won't show you. Um, but that's that's kind of our quick, uh, you know, logistical stuff on the back end that we try to do to, to organize the event. And like I said, we'll keep iterating on that and making it better. Jonas? Probably one of the most important things is not only having a text form of communicating, but in case of a six hour stream, you need a way to just be like, I want to talk to that person. Um, one thing that I often notice with distributed productions like this one is if their comms engineer or their comms system is run poorly, they'll get frustrated. They'll start to use like, hey, yeah, let's hang out in the Zoom. Let's let's text over WhatsApp. We didn't have that. So we were able to uh, provide a comm system where everyone could talk to everyone. So we just had a lot of callbacks hey, like, hey, I have this package ready. OK, it's loaded. Then it went through the production channel. Hey, package loaded on red. We took it live. Then the next one was like, hey, I think I have like a, a factory tour up uh, this time. This is different. OK, let's take that. Hey, we found this. They just mentioned this. Could you find the video for that? Real a lot of communication and enable using the tech to enable that and not building barriers. Um, what any good comms engineer should do. And so I was really happy to have Taco with me to manage all of that. So we just had comms that worked. Next question. John Fultz and Ceilings Grove again. Uh, wonder if a program like Rundown Creator would be useful for the screeners to sell ideas to producers. Noah? Sure, it's always worth taking a look at. Um, and obviously it's gotta be specific to the show itself and what we're doing. Um, we're using Google Docs right now for our run of show, um, which sounds like it's a little different than what you're um, describing, Roscoe, but I would love to take a look. Um, like I've said before, the best best tool wins, best idea wins. So we gotta um, see how it fits the application of what we're doing. Jonas. Yeah, I think uh, one of the things that Tucker and I were talking about internally is like for the next one, um, what would be great if you not only have a tool where like there's everything that's going to come up, but also give the host a little more control and like what they want to view. So like having, let's say, a small stream deck with four buttons that get communicated to us. So if they press a button, they're like, hey, we would like to see another factory to you. Like, hey, I need a break. Because um, obviously there were six hours on live and I felt like, giving them a button that just like, hey, I kind of need a net break and then we can talk whatever they need um, would have helped a little more. I feel like that's more on the communication side versus like having more docs for them to read. I want the talent to be able to focus on being talent. So just like having a quick, oh yeah, that looks interesting factory tour. Maybe he has a remote contributor being able to like tell the team without telling them audibly um, would have been probably a great improvement versus like adding more docs. Next question. Liberty White, Atlanta, Georgia. This being the first time you produced this kind of show, how did you rehearse? Where did you spend most of your pre-production time? Jonas? A big part of it is that the type and the content was the first, but the tech wasn't the first. We do, we do these type of shows all the time. So there were some differences. We not always have a lot of screeners and all that infrastructure, but that was away from the tech. So from the tech side, um, it was a pretty standard setup for us. Um, we didn't have that much uh, rehearsal time. There were some mismatches in time zones and uh, suddenly we were live um, right. and took it as it is. That worked quite well. A pre-production time, I spend a lot of time on making sure that it all is deterministic, which means just like, if I press this button, action Y has to happen. If Noah says, I need this, we need to be able to facilitate it and also being able to shift in that. So like if they're like, hey, um, our best friend suddenly is live on YouTube, can we somehow bring that in to say like, sure, give me two minutes. Um, okay. That was 
the time that we spend pre-production in from our team and just making sure that the tech kind of fades away like no one ever had to think about like what vmix instance is it on he has a multi-view and a stream deck if you press a button the same thing happens like on an atom there's not that much difference so the tech fades away and that's where we spend our pre-production time on yeah, because there's so many different scenarios that could come up and because not the tech park, but just the flow of the show, like where do you balance your time so that you make sure that this team of volunteers is is all cohesive? Noah? Yeah, it's the hierarchy of time and resources, right? right. To like prioritize what needs to go out when. Um, I guess that's one of the things I learned from Jonas too, of like, um, as a leader, I need to know what everybody's doing, but at the same time, we can stay in our zone a little bit too, <laughs> you know, and I could trust him to do the engineering side of stuff. Um, and Jonas was being kind earlier. I, I made a mistake before the show and, and um, messed up with a time zone. So I told him the show was starting two hours later than it was. And so, um, yeah, that was that was totally on my my part. And uh, yeah, uh, definitely one of those things that we'll learn from and correct and, and not do again. Um, but as far as like pre-production goes, honestly, the most, the majority of my time was spent with Josh. Um, and same thing with uh, Office Hours uh, Space and um, NAB, Josh and myself or Sky, the three of us like got together and basically hashed out what the shape would look like and what what we need to spend our time and resources on. And I feel like over time we're getting better at that and being more concise and being more focused on, on what that looks like. Bill. I had the, probably the smallest part of this, but I, every time I popped into a meeting with these guys, I just felt safe. And what I mean by felt safe was that I'm not wasting my time because I see Jonas or I see a Tucker and I know these people. I understand what they're capable of. I am not going to be wasting my effort working with these people to learn something. I will learn a ton. I will be able to, to hone my skills. I will not be wasting my time to do this. And that alone is worth its weight in platinum. Also on the office hours thing, it was interesting because uh, there was a, a, a Zoom meeting essentially open all the time. And that was interesting as as we were working with John Preto getting things ready for that. You could pop in any time of the day or night. So these alternate schedules where everybody's around, you had a place to go and there'd be three or four people there and you could ask things. We didn't have quite that much, but Noah and uh, and and Josh were both there a lot online. So if you just suddenly got uncomfortable about something that you had to do in relation to this, you could pop in and there would be somebody there to talk to. I found that really useful. Josh? And a lot of what we were doing pre-production was the, you know, what ifs and contingencies and trying to um, uh, choreograph it, uh, you know, in our heads as to what we expected to happen. And we're basing it off of things that were knowns, so um, that, which was very helpful with Jonas's workflow because for a lot of what he did, he, you know, he's had that same uh, production workflow. So that was a welcome uh, thing to add his production. So that would be less in the unknown category. Uh, some things that were more of the unknown category were our hosts. Um, we, it was our first time working with them, and we didn't have a mixtape to show them or like this is what this looks like whenever we've done this. So we had to best illustrate it as as best we could as to this is what we expect to happen this is what we'd we'd like to happen this is what's likely to happen and here's how we're gonna try to deal with that contingency all right next question next one comes to us from Cherik Chita in dallas how was the back end managed in terms of people calling into the show noah yeah, so this is a fun question because we plan for feast or famine again, right? And so we over engineered this a little bit. We brought on extra people to help with this, um, which weren't fully utilized, but um, we're super happy to have them and grateful to have them. But essentially, we um, were expecting people to call in who just wanted to talk to Zach and Jesse. They do have a pretty large following, um, strand strangers, people who weren't really there to contribute, right? So we are we had kind of like a filtered system, so people would pass through this filter. Um, and hit these different checkpoints to make sure, you know, their camera was good, their audio was good, um, they had good content to share, and that they weren't a crazy person, for lack of a better term, <laughs> you know, or a super, a super fan that was going to de derail the show. So um, we basically had this kind of system uh, infrastructure. Um, Josh might be able, I think he's showing a chart here and a couple questions to kind of go over what that might look like. Um, but yeah, that was kind of our system or, or pipeline. Bill? 
Yeah, that's kind of a little bit about where I was sitting through it. Chirig and I spent a good little bit of time uh, in the green room, essentially, kind of watching people come in. And most of the time, it was pretty easy to figure out, is this going to be a reasonable contributor to the show? Do they seem? And sometimes people just wanted to come in and talk. I will say that there was directing people into the green room. Uh, I there was some randomness to that. And there were some conversations I had that were lovely conversations, but I could tell immediately in the first two or three minutes of having those conversations that they really probably weren't going to contribute anything to the show. They wanted to talk and things like that. So, you know, we were trying to also be ambassadors to the public, thinking that this is the the primary interface as the public is calling in. And so we try to just be really nice and, and make people feel warm and fuzzy about the show. When we're making those decisions, do I send them to screening or do I just have this conversation with them and thank them for joining? Okay. Josh? And it's a process that got more refined. You know, we were kind of building it as we went. So we had a system that we planned for. And as some of the realities showed up, uh, like sometimes there would be uh, people, one of the interesting things we found that um, moving in between uh, rooms, that is waiting room, main room, and breakout room becomes an extra challenge whenever cell phone signal is an issue. So as we as we went, we started streamlining the number of hops that we would have to send our potential participants through. And if they had already been screened before, we could pull them right into our main contribution room as opposed to running them through the, our more uh, longer chain. Next question. Roscoe Jones in Brea, California comes up next and he says, Braden and v, uh, Vienna were the experts for space and you had two Tesla experts. So how do you find this depth in hosts and how do they need experience and do they need experience doing live? Noah. I think the reason why um, Braden and Vienna, Zach and Jesse showed up, even Jeff Powers and Jeff Keithley, was because of relationships, right? And so that touch point is super critical and super important um, because, yes, we need to do a task and, yes, they need to know what they're talking about. Um, but that personality and that uh, that re relationship touch point is super important, super critical to what made the, the system work. Jeffrey? Also, to be a host on a show floor or anything like that, you need to have a good amount of stamina and the ability to change at a moment's notice. Because if you get flustered over the fact, because we when we did the Frame.io thing, we thought we were going to come and do that interview and move on. But it turned out that uh, that the person that they wanted us to speak with, uh, Michael, he, uh, he had another thing going on and it went way over. So we had to make adjustments to do that. So you just have to plan for that. And of course, Good shoes. Great points. Next question. Chris Taylor in Carlsbad, California is up next. Josh, you were really good at creating flow charts. Do you have one for this event that you can share? Josh. Uh, the chart that I created was a first concept and it was something that we could use to look at and see. And, and um, the main thing that uh, we're trying to do with those charts is to figure out like what person has, has to have what access to so what comms channel should they have, what connections should they have, and sort of sort of a, a pathfinding method. And then once you refine it, it's helpful to be able to show uh, people, volunteers that come on, it's like, okay, you're going to be here. And so you're going to be making a connection with this person. And it gives them sort of the layout of the land, but um, definitely a, a work in progress. And, and as we looked at um, the work workflow that we used, we're continuing to refine that process. So better workflows in the future. Next question. Douglas Carmichael says, would you have a link to the finished production so that we can watch it? Jeff. I just put it in Mukana as the uh, link to the Now You Know broadcast. I think it's, what, uh, six hours and 35 minutes or so. So it's out there now. Thanks, Jeff. Next question. Jerry Cheetah in Dallas. Noah, how was it using cloud technology versus a physical setup? Noah, so, real quick. Yeah, when you're working on a Hollywood set, you have, like, 16 channels, but everybody talks independently of each other, right? So there's something called steppage where you step over each other and then it, nobody hears anything. That That's not the same in Unity. In Unity, you can have several people talking to you at the same time over several channels. And so I think that was kind of the only um, thing that like made me deer in headlights is like having all that communication happening at the same time. Um, but other than that, the, the flow of being online and not having to set up gear and 
be in person, I think was, was tremendous. And so, yeah, there's definitely some um, pros and cons to each side of it. And everybody should ser seriously consider doing a cloud-based show as well. Next question. Chirig is back from Dallas uh, for Jonas. How was this event the same or different from other productions you've done? Jonas? It was the same building blocks. We like to use the same building blocks. So we are staying away from the edge that could uh, you could fall down or hurt yourself on. But also there were some idiosyncrasies. We had way more producers than we normally would have for a call-in show just because of it volunteers. Um, obviously, it was more volunteer-led than um, hiring a bunch of people, which also then you tend to have a little um, volunteer bloat versus when you have to pay everyone, you normally have a little less crew. Um, I think that was the biggest difference. Otherwise, we try to keep our systems in a way that um, they stay the same so we know what happens and they're very stable that way. Next question. Jeff Keithley in Texas comes up with, is this production style just a familiar news format with non-traditional workflows? Noah? Yes and no. I think it is very similar to news, just like it's very similar to sports with a play-by-play -play and a color you know, commentator. It could be similar to a Macy's Day Parade where you have lots of things happening over a long period of time and somebody's talking about it. But at the end of the day, it's a mixture of many things that it's a collective that um, makes it its own thing. Phil? Yeah, I, to me, it seems like uh, having a coverage of a live event is always going to have slightly different rules than a created run of show type show that you have more flexibility with. Uh, but I think either one can work. I just think there's little tune up things. One demands one thing. Another one may have different kinds of inserts, a different rhythm to it and can be more controlled than something that's happened out in the real world. And you just got to react to it. Alex. Just like Office Hours is different than any show out there, uh, this is, uh, I think this is going to be growing into something that is, it's as Bill said, and, and as Noah said, it's own thing. Uh, it, it really is. And we have the advantage, of course, be, being a nonprofit with a bunch of very technical folks, uh, having a lot of volunteers, and we're going to be able to cover some of these events in, in a way that a broadcaster could never do. Um, you know, I think that we'll probably be, when the dust settles for NAM and and Cinegear, for instance, will probably have 40 to 50 people working on it. And, and that's a, you know, that's not, that that only happens at like political conventions, <laughs> you know, in the United States, they have a crew that big. So, um, you know, covering it and so, or, or football games or something like that. So I think that we're going to be able to, in with that opportunity, be able to um, expand and get creative in a way that you can't do when you're in broadcast. Josh. Yeah, I definitely think it's a different way of looking at, um, you know, a traditional show, what a show is and what, what a show can include. Uh, the way that we pitched it to um, the host is that imagine you're going to a live event and then you see people, you know, pull up their phone and you're like, well, you know, what are you doing? Oh, you know, I'm on this broadcast and I'm able to contribute. Oh, can, can I get into that? Can I do that? So you're actually having the opportunity of having a better experience with the digital uh, sort of like digital's revenge on the on the live events or hybrids, right? So where you're actually creating that opportunity and you're able to create a different scene. If you look at um, a Tesla official broadcast, um, they created a, a rehash of the event they just released like a couple days ago. It was like a short two minute film where they just changed the edit of what that event was. Well, if you have these varied um, contribution sources and Zoom has been a really good foundation for that because it's just so f so frictionless. Next question. Uh, Douglas Carmichael says, how can you have multiple users operating the same vMix instance without clashing between users? Jonas? The easiest answer is you hire a system from us. We manage all that. In reality, it's a thing that engineering manages. It's nothing you, a uh, technical director, needs to care about. Um, we provide you the access that you need to be successful and abstract all the complications of providing that under our hood. So like Tucker and I, we have direct access, but uh, Jeff never saw the vMix instance from inside and was able to cut a six hour show. Um, that's how we make it work. We engineer a solution for that specific need and remove all the complexity of doing a cloud production from you. So you can be successful in the same way that you know from like a normal event, you have buttons, a multi-view. If you press a button, something happens on the multi-view. No difference. Tucker? Yeah, I mean, he covered basically, uh, I'd say almost all of it that, that I would think of. The, the main thing for 
for us is just making sure that just like he said, whoever the artist is, and in this case, Jeff was the artist um, behind the console switching. I was the artist behind the console mixing um, in those situations, making sure that that they don't need to see the inside of vmix. They don't need to think about how how things are happening. Once you kind of get into that mindset, you get into a place where it's like, oh, this works. Like they just need a multi viewer and a control surface when they have those tools and proper onboarding, we're good. And one thing that we didn't talk about much on this is we rolled through at one point, um, I cut the show at one point, Jonas cut the show and for the bulk of the show, Jeff cut it. But with a six hour stream, being able to roll through techs and not have to worry about how they get in, how they get out and right. what it's going to do to the show when they do. It's fantastic. Noah. Yeah, if you don't realize this, there's a very strong fingerprint happening over a lot of these productions and that's Siona's and the back end and the things that he's creating and building. So I would highly recommend if you need any sort of cloud infrastructure or engineer or vMix system, AWS instances, Jonas is your guy. And Jeff. Uh, I'll just attest uh, out of all the vMix jobs I've had, I'd never mixed a show without vMix at my fingertips except this one and and literally it was a vpn and a stream deck and the template the stream deck template that Jonas had developed and sent to me and and i wouldn't have imagined that i would have been comfortable with it but i was perfectly comfortable with it it worked fantastic that's what's beautiful about the community and being able to try new things that you've never done before and for our last question Tommy Schantz in St. Paul, Minnesota is up for the final one. How much of this architecture will you be able to recycle and what would you do differently? Great question, Noah. I think we see patterns as humans and we like to see things happen over and over again. And we can see how um, one thing relates to the next thing, which are also great things. Um, but ultimately it's building blocks like we described before. And um, you know, we need this part and this part and this part to make it all to come together. So I would say as a general rule of thumb, maybe 50% would be translatable from one thing to the other. But the reality is even that 50% gets iterated on and improved upon and grown. Um, and so like gaining this experience is crucial to have these projects like this. But at the same time, this experience is transitory. And Jonas? I would say we can probably, we could probably reuse most of us because we use standard building blocks and we not try to like use something like self-coded that does one weird thing for that specific show. We do it in a standard way so it works. We do tear down our infrastructure and build it up again automatically. So we have it as soon as we log on, we it's again, you'll see the pattern deterministic. If I log on to that instance, I know 100% what it is. Doesn't matter if I'm doing a show in Ohio, like we did here in Ireland, Frankfurt, wherever I come, for me as an engineer, I know how the system is set up because everything is deterministic. And that's way we can give that to the tax. And someone like Jeff doesn't need to think about vMix at some point and can focus on their craft and their art, which we are all about to let you focus on what you're great at and we'll make sure that it all works. Well, here we are at the end of another fantastic show. Noah, Jonas, Josh, thank you so much for coming on to give us the breakdown, the behind the scenes of what happened at Cyber Rodeo to our producers. Great, great questions. And of course, our panelists, we couldn't do this without you. And remember, tomorrow we have Carl Asmussen coming to speak to us about synthesizers. And if you want to learn more about what's happening for the rest of the week, head over to officehours.global. And now we'll head into after hours. Thanks, everyone. I love it when Liberty hosts. She's great. She's pretty good. I love it too. <laughs> yeah. All those people. It takes a village. It takes a small city. <laughs> okay. Oh, a small city in Italy. <laughs> of the Tlaloc let's, let's buy one. Let's buy one. Let's buy a city in Italy. We can do it quarter million dollars can they move there sounds like a hybrid event we just need fiber <laughs>